you for the nice introduction. I uh, sincerely thank IMA for giving me this opportunity to talk amongst you. I've been asked to talk uh, on uh, the topic education in uh, Deficiency. 
Right, hyper-responsive alveoli. Sometimes uh, they used to say long-standing bronchial asthma could get converted into COPD. It is not true. Bronchial asthma is observably different from that of COPD. What happens in bronchial asthma if the patients are not given any proper treatment, of course a drug of choice is inhaled steroids, if you are not putting the patients on proper medication, that is something called as airway remodeling and that causes the reversibility which was absolutely previously into an improper reversibility akin to that of COPD. But it is definitely not COPD. Okay. Coming to this particular thing, the most common things are smoking, atmospheric pollution and then occupational exposure. Right. I am not going into details, you all know well, packs of COPD, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Uh, here there is excessive amounts of mucus production causing the airway caliber to decrease, resulting in this amount of an airway caliber that causes wheezing, increased amount of uh, you know, sputum production. Whereas in emphysema, this is an anatomical deformity where there is absolute derangement of the alveolar walls of the sacs. Okay. So yes, this one slide shows everything. You see here the, the purple one and the the blue one. Way back in 2006, you see 28 million patients had bronchial asthma, whereas COPD was much less than that, 17 million. But there is a definite increase in the next one decade. 20, 35 million patients with bronchial asthma and 22.2 million COPD patients. And this one is going to be much higher in the days to come. So, we'll talk about the topic per se, nutrition and COPD. So, what are the various factors affecting the nutritional intake in COPD? So, you take COPD, there are lots of factors involved. One is the physical one, social, pharmacological and psychological. Basically, these four things, four factors. Talking about physical factors in COPD that is being affected by patients' symptoms like dyspnea, fatigue, dyspagia. Talking about the social factors, they are isolated socially. Let us accept the truth. This is the truth what we face in most of the patients. They are isolated socially. Mostly they are homebound because by the time they approach us, they are already in a moderate or a severe stage of COPD. And because of the medications and all the other stuff, they are unable to move out of their houses. So they are predominantly homebound unemployment. I don't have to explain why this occurs. Pharmacological things, because of the side effects of medications, you all know well. The drug of choice in case of COPD is a bronchodilator and amongst the bronchodilator you have got a beta agonist and then you have got anticholinergic which can be further divided into a long acting one and a short acting one. So the predominant two medications given for COPD will be teotropium and palmetrol and teotropium is one wonderful drug but unfortunately side effects like dry mouth does occur, oral thrush because of long usage of inhaled steroids and then the taste changes. Lastly, the psychological uh, problems, they are definitely depressed. We have done a specific study on this thing. What is the amount of depression in COPD patients? The results are how we had to publish the report. Patients are isolated and then loneliness. So all these factors play uh, a role, if not predominantly in case of COPD. Okay, now weight loss in COPD. What is the predominant mechanism or mechanisms of weight loss in COPD? Before that, what are the reasons for poor nutrition in persons per se with COPD? One is the aging, hypoxia, systemic inflammation. I told this is an inflammatory disorder. Bronchial asthma is also a systemic inflammatory disorder. But please do understand, bronchial asthma is characterized by an eosinophilic inflammation. That is the reason why inhaled steroids are going to work very nicely in bronchial asthma. Whereas in case of COPD, it is the neutrophilic inflammation resulting in a damage to the alveolar walls. So inhaled steroids does not have any role in case of treatment of COPD as a first line agent. Medications like steroids, increased metabolic rate. So all these factors could play as a reason for poor nutrition in COPD. So COPD causes malnutrition. What are the various mechanisms? Number one, there is low oxygen, anorexia and dyspnea that results in decreased energy intake resulting in malnutrition. So this is one aspect. Second thing is, COPD is known for its release of inflammatory mediators and this is being increased in case of exacerbation. COPD patients are known for their exacerbations in spite of they being on medications. So that <coughs> increase the release of inflammatory mediators. So this inflammatory mediators, once they are released, they have changes in protein metabolism causing malnutrition. And the release of inflammatory mediators 
clause decrees are being taken, this cycle takes over. And then I was talking about exacerbations in COPD. They are a part and parcel of any COPD patients. That results in increase in amount of inflammatory mediators. Exacerbations result in hypermetabolism. And this hypermetabolism could be because of drugs like steroids, etc. Increased respiratory work. I hope all of you would have faced a patient with a, a dynamic hyperinflation. You can also experience those. If you take in a deep breath and then hold the breath over there and try to breathe above that. It is almost impossible. So that is the state of our COPD patients, dynamic hyperinflation, increased respiratory work. So all these factors play uh, why patients develop malnutrition in case of COPD. Most of the patients would be getting one or other steroids, inflammatory uh, medications. These steroids could be as a part of an oral medication or as a part of an inhalational medication. So the first drug we give a combination of an ICS and a LABA. So what are the effect of corticosteroids in case of our COPD patients? Number one, they inhibit the protein synthesis, increases the protein catabolism, dose-related effects of steroids, specifically the oral steroids. Doses more than 60 milligrams per day definitely leads to decreased respiratory muscle strength. Now, what are the consequences of malnutrition in such patients? Now, malnutrition in COPD causes the quality of life to be on the lower side for obvious reasons, okay? Number two, there is a peripheral muscle strength on the lower side. I told you in the previous slide what is the reason for that. The respiratory muscle function decreases and then there is a decrease in activity because of the disease per se, because of medications. So all these things results in increase in morbidity as well as mortality. Fatigue increases and then finally increase in the health care cost. And this health care costs are expected to triple, at least triple in case the patients are going to have an exacerbation, at least one exacerbation per se, right? Now having had a patient with malnutrition, how do we uh, assess for the malnutrition, okay? Now we may have to initially identify the malnutrition according to the risk category. So there are lots of scales available. I use this simple one, malnutrition universal screening tool called as a must. So it is available online, you can download and use it on COPD patients. So then you will have to categorize your patients as per that. Low risk, medium risk, and then high risk patients. Now, various ways of doing that. Number one is to calculate the patient's BMI. If the BMI is 20, that is zero. 18.5 to 20, score one. Less than 18.5, give them a score of two. So that is the first thing. Second thing, if there is a weight loss score, if there, if there is an unplanned weight loss in a patient in the previous three months category, less than 5%, the score is 0. 5 to 10%, it is 1. And more than 10% weight loss in the last three months, they should be given a score of 2. The third thing is the actual ill score. Check if your patient is actually ill. And there has been or likely to be no nutritional intake for such patients for more than five days, give the score as 2. So once you give, score them all of this, put in your total score and categorize them. If it is zero, low risk. If it is one, medium risk. Anything more than that is a high risk category patient. So once you categorize your patients based on the score as zero, low risk, one medium risk and two high risk, treat them. If the patients are having a low risk, just the routine clinical care as of your view for any COPD patients. You have a mild COPD patient, you put them on a short acting beta agonist as an SOS basis. If the patients are going to have a moderate COPD, put them on a lava lama combination. Or if the patients are experiencing recurrent exacerbations, you can add either roplamilast or you can put the patients on an inhaled steroid along with lava and a lama. So that is a routine clinical care. Then if the patients are having a medium risk, as far as the nutritional status is concerned, you can wait and watch. Just observe the patients on a periodic basis. I take a cutoff of at least once in four weeks. If the patients are at a high risk, you will have to put them on treatment on a nutritional wise. So, how do you do that? Low risk patients ensure appropriate food and drinks, routine follow up, repeat screening every three to six months, treat obesity if the BMI is more than 30, and raise awareness of consuming proper and healthy diet. Medium risk encourage small meals, good protein intake, and fluids. If the BMI is low, put them on oral nutritional support and review them every once in three months. 
On the other hand, if they are at a high risk, dietary advice to maximize the nutritional intake, encourage small meals, good protein intake and fluids, prescribe oral nutritional support, monitor them every two weeks. Okay. Now, how do you approach them? Simple. Assess with the history, examination and lab investigations. If they are mildly malnourished or moderately to severely malnourished, severely malnourished, aggressive therapy is required. My patients just think over if they really require an aggressive therapy. If not, just put them on oral nutrition supplements, that is more than sufficient. On the other hand, if you think they require an aggressive therapy, check if their GA tract is functional or not. If it is functional, give them oral nutritional support or enteral nutrition. If not, put them on parental nutrition. So how to use oral nutrition supplements in the management of COPD? So if the patients have a low BMI less than 20 or high risk of malnutrition, check, I mean, record the details of their risk category. Discuss the goals with the patient. Please do involve your patients in all the treatment decisions. <coughs> Consider the symptoms of disease and treat them. Confirm if the patient be able to eat or drink and consider any other physical issues like dysphagia, presence of dentures, etc. So once you check all these things, prescribe them to oral nutritional uh, therapy at least a day in addition to the routine oral intake. Give low volume, high energy and high protein intake. And once you prescribe them, follow up them, monitor with their compliance every month, progress and review the goals once in three months, and then check if the nutrition goals are met or not. If they are met, Encourage oral intake and dietary advice, reduce from 2 to 1 oral nutrition support per day for at least 2 weeks prior to stopping them totally and monitor the progress periodically at least once in 2 to 4 months. On the other hand, if the nutritional goals are not met, check the ONS compliance and amend the prescription, review them, reassess them every month, I mean every 6 months, consider the more intense nutritional therapy and obtain a dietitian advice as early as possible. So when to stop ONS, the treatment goals are met, patients is are no longer at risk of malnutrition, are free to stop it. If the patient is clinically stable, you can stop it. If the patients are able to eat and drink and meet the nutritional needs, you can very safely stop them. And if no further clinical input would be appropriate, you are free to stop the ONS. So benefits of ONS, they improve the exercise performance, improve the respiratory muscle strength, improve the nutritional intake, gets the patient to gain much more weight, improve the quality of life and increase the protein and energy without affecting the dietary intake. Okay. So, to summarize, you have a patient with COPD, monitor the patient for the COPD status, categorize them mild, moderate and severe or at risk, take them off the noxious particle, put them on medications. Monitor the medications and compliance, assess the nutritional status, support the patient with ONS per se. So, any queries? related to the nutrition or anything on COPD, medications, etc. Thank you.